using active listening skills to improve listening comprehension in expository discussions. And this is presented, and I'm very pleased to, to welcome Melissa as today's presenter. Uh, Melissa has worked in language education for almost 20 years, and her professional career bridges between ESL and business. She has taught in Australia and overseas in Spain, Japan, and China, in a range of settings from small private schools to vocational colleges and universities, teaching English for business and global communication. She currently works with international students on pathways to graduate degrees in various fields at Monash University, that's in Melbourne, Australia, as well as with postgraduates preparing to enter the Australian workplace. So I'll just hand you over to Melissa now. Thank you. Uh, hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining me to hear about how you can use active listening skills to improve your students' listening comprehension in expository discussions and have more real, lively, enjoyable conversations in the L2. I'm going to begin by explaining the action research project I undertook with my colleague Anne Snayers in 2017. And after that, I'll share with you some examples of activities we found successful that you might like to try with your students. Okay, I'm gonna pretend for a moment to be a couple of students in my class discussing how best to help endangered animals. First student says, I think we should protect endangered animals by building more nature reserves because then they have a safe place to live. Second student says, yes, I agree. We should stop pollution because it kills all the animals. How about you? Does this sound familiar? A statement of opinion from the first student and an entirely unrelated response from the second student. The students are taking turns to state their opinions, but the absence of response to each other's ideas suggests they are not listening to each other, not really. So we ask them a question. If a tree falls in a forest and no one is around to hear it, does it still make a sound? This question is an ancient riddle. The scientific view is that a falling tree makes waves in the air, but to make a sound, it takes an ear to hear it. The students were undecided, so we followed with a second question. If a person speaks and no one listens, is there really communication? The class was unanimous on this one, no. So our purpose in asking these questions was to raise awareness that listening was an essential but often overlooked half of communication and so elevate its importance in the minds of our students. And why does it matter so much that students get really good at this? Well, it defines their ability to connect with others, both inside and outside the classroom. And how you do that is a cultural thing. And ultimately, it will impact opportunities that may be available to our students. And so we embarked on our action research project with the purpose of exploring whether active listening skills could improve participatory listening comprehension and so the quality of communication in expository discussion. It was natural for us to go to active listening skills because of our backgrounds, mine in business and Anne's in coaching. Of course, Active listening skills is a communication te technique we're all familiar with in the context of counseling and conflict resolution. And we commonly associate it with 
listening as intentional work. Or the idea of hearing what people are really saying, being empathetic and deferring judgment. Interestingly, active listening was an easy concept for our predominantly Chinese students because it turns out it's also in their language. As can be seen from the five aspects of the Chinese pictograph for the word to listen. So what do we mean by active listening? Giving the speaker your undivided attention putting the speaker in the spotlight, being present to the speaker with open mind and heart, but also importantly, showing this with various verbal and nonverbal signs, which I'll speak more about in a moment. So who were our students? They were a class of 16 at Monash College. They were upper intermediate level, which means in Australia, IELTS uh, entry five. We had them for 10 weeks, a total of two terms, and taught them a mix of general English with academic elements. They were all Asian, mostly Chinese, aged 17 to early 20s, so fairly mature and certainly motivated. Uh, they were mostly on postgraduate pathways to Monash Uni and Monash was very interested in finding ways to help them successfully transition. So here's what our active listening skills program looked like. We did one action research cycle over a period of 10 weeks. Each week, we taught and practiced a new skill through various interactive activities and integrated these into regular discussion practice in the curriculum. Our aim was to train the students in six different sub-skills of active listening and to build these skills steadily and reinforce them. In the first week, we established the concept and set the expectation of being present to the speaker. We followed with nonverbal signs, smiling, nodding, eye contact, leaning in, mirroring body language, and semi-verbal signs, specifically back channeling. Uh-huh, mm, yep. After that, the more challenging verbal signs. Firstly, echoing, restating key words of the speaker. Paraphrasing to clarify meaning. Then reflecting, which also involves paraphrasing, but to mirror meaning and so demonstrate understanding. Lastly, questioning and commenting to build on the speaker's idea and drive the conversation. So you're probably looking at this and thinking, hang on, I teach this to my students all the time. How is this different? Well, our experience was that telling is not enough. What's different was training them in strategies, step by step. We shifted away from asking, what tools do we need to give them? to how can we help them use the tools available to them and use each other as a resource to scaffold meaning. For our research, we collected both qualitative and quantitative data. We conducted three surveys, one at the beginning, the middle and the end. Initially, so students could self-evaluate their listening comprehension and then to monitor changes in their perceptions and confidence over time. Students made video audio recordings of themselves in revision lessons to self-assess for active listening skills and re-record to improve. 
In the final week, week 10, they actually made a movie to teach active listening skills to their peers. Teachers and students kept journals to capture weekly reflections on learnings. And there were the assessment scores. Now we analyzed video recordings of discussions in the mid course assessment, which happened at the five week point and the end of course assessment uh, at the 10 week point. And these were the speaking assessments specifically. Uh, so we analyzed these to see um, our classes progress over time. And we also compared exam results for speaking with the rest of the upper intermediate cohort. Now, we needed a measure for changes in listening comprehension in this context. We used relevancy of response and degree of engagement, criteria that were already a part of the speaking discussion assessment rubric at Monash. And we compared our class and the rest of the upper, upper intermediate cohort. The result for these two criteria for our class was that there was a noticeable upward trend in engagement results between the mid course assessment and the end of course assessment, but there was no noticeable increase in relevancy. Overall speaking results in comparison with the rest of the upper intermediate cohort can be seen in the graph. So our class in blue were initially weaker on average than the rest of the cohort, but by the end of the program, they were almost on a par. The end of course median for our class was 80% which was 5% higher than the median in the other classes. So we, that told us that we had a stronger top half of students in our class. So it's worth noting the speaking discussion exams were not scored by Anne or me, but by other teachers. Watching the videos of the exams later, we could see our students applying active listening skills. It was apparent to us that the active listening skills effect was to lead to an increase in engagement in the discussion, which led to a perception by the examiner of greater communicative competence, which led to better speaking exam results overall. So what were our students' perceptions? In surveys, students initially rated themselves highly on listening comprehension in discussions. 50% rated themselves greater than, rated themselves seven out of 10 or more. By the end of the program, 75% rated themselves seven out of 10 or more for listening comprehension in discussion. Now, the main reason they gave for discussions not going well was not understanding each other and not knowing what to do when comprehension breakdowns occurred. By the end, they were more confident in handling communication breakdowns in discussion. There was a 60% increase in confidence. There were also collateral benefits. There was more class interaction with the teacher and with each other. Less going through the motions of classroom exercises and instead, more authentic, lively, enjoyable conversations. There was improved motivation. And what's more, we felt that we didn't just teach them English, but cultural skills, interpersonal skills, and even life skills, developing them as human beings, a more holistic approach. So, what was the difference active listening skills made? Through really tuning into each other, an effective involvement was generated between the students, a kind of interpersonal solidarity between interlocutors. This led to increased motivation and freedom to speak without fear, 
more risk taking, which in turn led to accelerated learning. Speakers felt encouraged to speak and output was pushed by feedback from the listener. Here's how our students described their active listening skills journey. They, speaking and listening, will affect each other. When listener got a good listening and give a feedback of good understanding and interests, the speaker will perform well and vice versa. I think the speaking is the area of greatest improvement for me. Ten weeks ago, I felt nervous when I talked to the people who I was not familiar with. But now I can be a confident person to communicate with other people. It was so great for us to see students make the connection between speaking and listening. And overall, Anne and I found the whole project very enlightening and rewarding. Okay. So now, um, the second part of the presentation, I have a sample of activities we use to help train our students in active listening skills. These activities are not necessarily unique or even original, but they're a blend of ideas found online and our own. What's new is the active listening context in which they are applied. So I encourage you to take them, adapt them to suit your contexts, and I'm sure you'll be able to develop and improve upon them. Okay. An excellent friend versus a terrible friend. So this is an experiential activity where students discover the power of body language and back channeling in giving positive feedback to the speaker. So making the speaker feel at ease and feel encouraged to continue and to speak more openly and honestly. So break your class into groups of three and round one, student A shares a problem. Student B is a terrible friend and student C, the observer. Give them time to have this exchange and then have a class debrief. Ask student A, what was that like? Elicit, well, I didn't want to continue. I felt they weren't interested. Ask the student C's, well, what did B do to be a terrible friend? What did you observe? Elicit, lack of eye contact, a bored expression, possibly playing with the mobile phone, no encouraging noises or sounds. Round two. Again, A shares a problem. This time B is the observer and C the excellent friend. In the class debrief, ask A what was it like, elicit. Well, I felt I wanted to tell him more. I felt he really cared. B, uh, the B students, well, what did C do to be an amazing friend? What did you notice? Elicit signs of listening, smiling, nodding, eye contact, leaning in, a sympathetic expression, and listening noises, back channeling. Yes, oh no, uh-huh. So this was a really fun activity and a great way at the beginning um, for students to take ownership of the nonverbal signs. A further activity you could follow this up with is analyzing a video of an interview or a conversation in the media to see how people show interest. So the next suite of activities the listener demonstrates active listening by seeking clarification. Sorry, you've lost me. Or paraphrasing speaker's words to check understanding. So you mean plus paraphrase. The speaker may prompt the listener as well to confirm understanding. 
Are you still with me? Okay, so for this activity, first brainstorm or pre-teach the language on the slide, and then put the students in any real context where they experience communication challenges and need to ask for clarification to maintain communication. Some examples we tried. The bad phone line. Students work in pairs and pretend to have conversations on the phone with their partner. Each student receives a roll card with instructions to invite their partner to a particular event and give them directions on how to get there. While students are talking, add some background noise. For example, a thunderstorm. Turn it up every so often to increase the difficulty. Solve a maths problem. In pairs, students solve a maths problem. One student reads the problem while the other does the maths. Start with five, multiply by four, divide that by two, subtract three, then multiply by 10, then take half of that. What do you get? Are you still with me? Draw a picture. Pairs sit back to back. One describes a picture while the other reproduces it as accurately as possible. Discussion benchmarks. In small groups, students have a discussion about a class topic and are given the following benchmark. They must check each, they must each check for understanding at least once, ask for clarification twice, and explain something in different words once. Okay, so moving on, another important sign of listening for students to learn is reflecting. By this we mean mirroring the speaker. Now this can happen in many different ways. We can mirror body language. This is something that happens subconsciously in conversation when a positive connection occurs. But this, this can also be a technique that can be consciously used to build rapport. It works because people are drawn to what's similar. We can also mirror the emotions of a speaker. This is for the purpose of showing empathy and can be seen in copying the facial expressions of the speaker or naming the speaker's feeling. So having pre-taught vocabulary for emotions, in controlled practice, pairs A and B take turns reading sentences with emotion. The listener guesses the emotion and reflects it back. For example, speaker A, I lied to my parents about my exam results. Speaker B, you're feeling a bit guilty about that. Now it's speaker B's turn. No matter how much I diet, I can't seem to lose weight. Speaker A, oh, how frustrating. Okay, so the next is reflecting words. So this is uh, a technique called echoing, where you simply, the listener simply repeats the speaker's key words to show that they heard to show that the message got through. So how is this boy going to echo this love smitten girl? I think I love you. Love me. So to practice this skill, you can ask your students to imagine that they're at a cocktail party. Set the scene by playing Miles Davis, relaxing. Students write down three impressive facts about themselves they'd like to share with the people they meet at the party. As they mingle, the listeners must echo key words and do little else. In the debrief after the activity, ask how they felt when people at the party echoed what they said. 
elicit, well, we felt encouraged to speak. We felt like people were interested in what we had to say. It helped us keep the conversation going. Another sign of active listening is mirroring the ideas of a speaker to show comprehension. So this is effectively paraphrasing, but not to check meaning, rather to build rapport, to simply demonstrate that you're listening. So how would he mirror her idea? Melbourne is known as the architectural capital of Australia. So I can see lots of interesting buildings there. Try some controlled practice. In pairs, A and B, A reads out a sentence and B reflects the idea back to A, like so. I'm not very keen on romantic, move, on romantic comedies. What would speaker B say just to reflect the idea? Okay, so you prefer more serious films. Uh-huh, you're not a romantic type? Speaker B's turn. Graffiti artists suggest vandals. Speaker A, uh-huh. So you don't think graffiti has any artistic value? An extension of this, which students really enjoyed, was a discussion, which could be in groups of any size. Some students are participants and some are observers. The only rule is that a student cannot speak unless they first paraphrase, reflect back, the idea of the previous speaker to show they listened. If they don't, the observer hands them a yellow card for which they have to either paraphrase or if they can't, give up the turn to another speaker. The students really enjoyed this one and were quite challenged because they, they recognized that a lot of the time they were not listening, they were simply thinking about their own thought and preparing what they wanted to say. So it was, a, it was an excellent exercise. Okay, moving on to uh, the last skill, questioning. So to explore the power of questioning, begin by eliciting from students different reasons why we ask questions in conversation. Um, elicit clarifying, finding out more details, checking understanding, moving the conversation forward in a particular direction, creating engagement and interaction between speakers. Ask the student what a good question looks like. The question matches the topic. It links fluently to what was just said. The question is open, not closed. So inviting more discussion. One good example of an activity here was a slow conversation about hobbies. Students work in teams of three and ask me, the teacher, about my hobbies. After each response, they brainstorm with their group for one minute to come up with an amazing follow-up question. The group who asks the best question is given a point, a colored card. There are 10 points to be gained. Students write their question on the card so we can take a closer look later. I answer the question I find most interesting and the process repeats itself. Questions must be on topic, open, and probably a little quirky and therefore offering opportunities for progressing the conversation in interesting ways. Students finish by typing all their awesome questions in a Google Doc. Okay, so the very last activity I have for you is the marriage counselor. This was another fun one that brings quite a lot of the skills together. So in groups of three, students brainstorm problems that a newly married couple might have that could cause them to stop speaking to each other. 
Secondly, the three students are each assigned a role, husband, wife or marriage counsellor. The marriage counsellor's role is to save the marriage. But because the newlyweds aren't speaking, aren't on speaking terms, everything the husband or wife says must go through the counsellor, who must relay it to the other person, paraphrasing the meaning and the emotion. Remind counsellors not to make a judgment. Okay, now to recap. The reasons for success uh, of our active listening skills intervention. It raises the awareness of the importance of listening. It sets the expectation of being present to the speaker, showing you're listening. It trains in strategies rather than tell strategies. And the need to build and negotiate meaning provides the reason to learn the strategy. It gets the effective involvement of students, so enhancing their motivation, the quality of interaction and understanding. And it integrates listening and speaking skills. The output of the speaker is pushed by listener feedback. Through repetition, it leads to retention. Okay, that's all I have for you. Uh, I hope that was interesting and helpful. And I'm happy to answer any questions as best I can. Thank you very much. That's great. Um, I really like the results you, you got from that and some really, really good. Sorry, my microphone's in the wrong place. There we go. And some really good results from your um, students as, as well as great activities shown there. So thank you very much for that. Yeah, please type in your questions and I shall try and put a few now to uh, to Melissa. So. Let me kick off with a few. Um, the first one I've got here is, what were the challenges or, or limitations of the research that you carried out? Uh, I think finding the time to uh, do it all um, as an, uh, you know, something beyond the, the daily work of uh, teaching the curriculum. Uh, overcoming initially some um, uh, just some uh, disinterest perhaps by the students. Uh, they needed to buy into the concept and um, I think I think probably that was that was all. Uh, I was interested that the uh, results for relevancy uh, didn't improve. Uh, I think this was because basically uh, there were still uh, language challenges and uh, it takes obviously takes time to uh, for language to come up but um, certainly the interactivity and the negotiation of meaning uh, between the students was the most valuable outcome I think for them yeah thanks sir. another question in just if, if you had a two-hour class or let's say a very short amount of time um, and then within that you you've got only got a small amount of time to do listening skills what what things what key things do you think you would focus on um, uh, you know what activities or what part of listening would you focus on if you've just got a short amount of time with your students mm -hmm. um, well Traditionally, we, we follow the comprehension approach with listening where we, we listen to an audio and, and the students answer comprehension questions. But I need to um, state, restate that this was participatory listening. So this listening was a part of a speaking uh, class. So uh, in teaching speaking skills, uh, the approach is to actually uh, teach them to listen better and um, so scaffold off each other. Uh, so I, it's, it's, it's very important to um, get student buy into the idea and um, go step by step. So I, I, in, a, in any speaking lesson, uh, even a short one, 
uh, I would introduce this concept of the importance of listening and then uh, say, okay, today we're going to practice this skill and uh, uh, teach the skill and then uh, in the speaking practice, they get to use that in, in discussion. I, I hope that answers the question. Okay, another one here. I think this was towards the beginning of the of the talk about reflective subskills. Could you give an example of what you mean by the reflect reflecting subskills? Hmm. So um, reflecting is um, a broad umbrella term uh, for uh, mirroring the speaker, and we can do that by mirroring body language. Uh, we can mirror uh, key words. Uh, by echoing, you know, like I've got a PhD from Harvard. Oh, Harvard! Uh, it's just just uh, repeating or mirroring a key word, and we can also uh, reflect emotion, uh, and we can reflect ideas. Uh, so, uh, paraphrasing the speaker's idea uh, to demonstrate that we we got the message, we understood. Yeah. Okay, another question here, thank you. Um, should we be teaching culture as well? Because I think that comes from, I, I don't know, maybe you see differences in different students from different parts of the world with their, with their listening, but um, what, do, what do you think about that? Mm, the the mm. culture of where you are or, you know, the country that you're teaching in? Yeah, well, uh, the way I see it, obviously language is uh, an intricate, part of culture and when we learn language we learn culture we can't help that process happening and um, uh, I think the way people interact with each other is embedded in culture and uh, yeah so uh, I think intercultural skills and intercultural competence is something that we um, comes with the territory of learning a language and we model that as teachers and um, yeah I, I mean it's not um, our first purpose but it's it's embedded in language learning I think yeah it's a good good question here said so I, I have this is um, from somebody I have read somewhere that 45% of, of, of the day is spent in listening but we really rarely listen to 30% of what is being said. What can be the strategy that can keep students motivated towards listening more basically? I think that's what they're trying to say, especially with the younger learners. There's a number of questions about younger learners as well. Mm, mm. Yeah, uh, I, I think... There's, a, there's always a motivational question there to keep students of, of this age, you know, younger learners and sort of teen learners motivated or listening. Yes. Well, I, I, I'm not working with very young people. Um, I'm mostly working with people in their 20s. And uh, I, I, I think describing the problem, um, you know, that, that our minds work um, a lot faster than we can speak. So we can listen a whole lot faster than, than the speaker can speak. And so we end up um, uh, uh, focusing on our response or focusing on our our own thoughts, um, going on a thought journey of our own, and we and the moment we do that, we stop listening. And um, and I think obviously with young people and mobile phones, we live in a world of huge distraction. Uh, so yeah, I, I think I think for them to get on board they need to see the value of it and mm. and I think they start to enjoy um, being listened to and returning the favor <laughs> and yeah. and also also actually helps them with their with their speaking so where there are decoding gaps and they can't uh, Follow, you know, they hit a wall in the comprehension, in the discussion, or they're a weak speaker. They know that they can echo and that they can um, attempt uh, a, a paraphrase or, you know, ask a question uh, that that 
that can um, assist them in participating in the conversation. So uh, I think um, uh, just a, a strategy uh, to make it easier to listen is to actually focus on and repeat in your mind the words that the speaker has said. Uh, and this, this can actually help you um, overcome distractions, yeah. Sure. And obviously, the more practice at it you get, the, the quicker you are at responding or better at listening. Excellent. So mm -hmm. another question here, how do, how do you encourage students to express emotions while speaking? I think you did have some exercises there, mm -hmm. and I think in red you had the emotions to be expressed. But is there any way that you can really try and uh, make students aware of or use use emotions more? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't I don't know, really. Um, that was uh, that wasn't a huge part of our program actually. Uh, it was just a bit of a an experiment, mm. and um, uh, I mean we, we played games with them uh, where they stood up and uh, mirrored each other. Uh, so pretending there was a mirror and they were looking into a mirror and two rows of students, and so one one row reflect the body language um, and and expression, facial expression. Um, but then transferring that into expressing feeling as you speak um, is almost a bit of an acting skill. Mm. But yeah, so I don't I don't really have an answer, except that I do a lot of modeling. Uh, mm. and hamming things up to sort of show them what I want. <laughs> sure, no, that's fine. That's great. Well, thank you very much. I think we've I think we've um, grilled you enough there. Um, thanks everybody um, so much for attending and for your questions. I'm sorry we we could we could talk about this all day. Um, and thank you for being very good listeners during that. Um,